continue. Okay, so in principle, we have now let's just recap. We had this uh, M manifold. We were in now this position, so we know that the vector fields, the vector fields to be defined, is a knee algebra. And uh, we have a locally convex topology on this uh, on this algebra turning into locally convex vector space. Unfortunately, we know the continuity of the bracket only, so uh, this is a locally convex algebra. Actually, we uh, as well said several times, we can extend this result a little bit. But uh, certainly you cannot uh, have this, at least not with the proof I gave, for every infinite dimension of manifold. This will depend heavily on what the, uh, how good the model space is of the uh, manifold. Anyway, so, uh, so the, I'm hiding a few details. We were actually, uh, we ought to actually only prove this locally in one chart domain. We have already hinted already uh, how, uh, how you can um, Pull this over to all vector fields, and it's an exercise to uh, to do the technical details, right? Uh, and basically, the the ideas have already all been explained. We basically, this relatedness to transport over to the side if you know it locally. Uh, but to check the details is a little bit of, of work. So we do that as as an um, as an example. Okay. So now we really want to set out to define the Lie algebra for a Lie group. So I mean, this was not just an example of a Lie algebra. Let's um, give another definition. So, and this are the so called left variant vector fields. And uh, so the setting is as follows we consider the Lie group. Take a vector field x on the new group. So typically our new interest will be infinite dimensional, but uh, okay, so we take a vector field and we say uh, x is left x is lambda g related. Just write out what this relatedness condition means here. So um, we basically, basically know so lambda g relates to itself means x composed with lambda g should then be the same as x tangent of lambda g composed with x. And let's write this out in a little bit more usual notation. So this is if you have x composed with lambda g, yeah, that's uh, that's perhaps good as follows. Uh, so, if you have evaluate the left invariant vector field at point G, then of course this is X uh, composed with lambda G evaluated at the unit. Right? Okay, what I mean, I'm just writing G as G times the unit. So, this is T lambda G applied to X evaluated at the unit. And what this shows is uh, that a left invariant vector field is uniquely determined by its value at the unit. Right. So I just need to know the value at the unit and then I'm shoving it around using this operation all over the manifold, uh, all over the manifold G. Right. So in principle, um, this guy here, this is an element of the tangent space at the identity of my manifold. Right, and we're using the multiplication to propagate this vector at the tangent space over, uh, over all of G. I should mention that, uh, okay, first of all, a little bit of notation. Uh, so we know, uh, so let's say, uh, we know by uh, F by G, L, G, set. Of all uh, left fields um, okay, and 
let's let's note something. So left invariance is defined in uh, with respect to relatedness. We have seen yesterday this lemma that uh, the Lie bracket preserves relatedness conditions. So if I take uh, the Lie bracket of uh, two left invariant vector fields, then the result will always be a left invariant vector field, just because uh, left invariance just means you it's related with respect to all these lambda g methods, right? And this is preserved by the bracket. So we find out that V L V is a subalgebra of all the vector fields from G to the bracket of vector fields. Right? And these subalgebra just means I can restrict the new bracket to the larger one to the, to the smaller one and get a new algebra structure on the small space. Okay. Um, I to just introduce notation, um, or uh, just one remark. So if you have left invariant vector fields, you of course also get right invariant vector fields. And the definition for right invariant vector fields is exactly as for left invariant, except that you have to replace the left multiplication with G everywhere with right multiplication with G. Right? So, uh, well, okay, so it's, uh, it's an open end. So I'm not, I'm not writing that out. So just saying, uh, we encountered this yesterday when we trivialized the tangent bundle of the of the Lie group, uh, where we said, well, it's immaterial whether you use left or right multiplication for trivialization. Uh, Here, uh, we're using left invariant vector fields, and we will see that this Lie algebra of left invariant vector fields will be uh, the Lie algebra associated to the Lie group G. Um, we, will, we will explain what that actually means. And um, so the whole point here is that uh, instead of constructing the associated Lie algebra using left invariant vector fields, <coughs> one could also use right invariant vector fields. And this would give you uh, a similar Lie algebra up to the flip of the sign with the bracket. So if you compute the Lie bracket for these uh, left invariant vector fields, and then you use uh, the Lie uh, bracket for the right invariant vector fields, then the sign changes. Yeah? So uh, basically, the Lie algebra of left invariant vector fields is anti isomorphic to the Lie algebra of right invariant vector fields because we have this flip of the sign. And, uh, this is purely for historical reasons that one uses left invariant vector fields. So there's actually no, uh, no good reason why one should prefer left multiplication over right multiplication. Uh, or historically, the Lie algebra associated with Lie groups is defined using the left invariant vector fields. Yes? I have a question on that because in the finite dimension case, yes, compute, then uh, you can choose the well, uh, community of that means you can write the and so on. Then. It's always a lot of different interpretation of left and right, isn't it? Depends, not from the point of view that you want to just define a Lie bracket. I mean, uh, it depends, yeah, we, we shall see. I mean, um, we shall encounter this today and probably tomorrow several times that uh, there's sort of a choice of left and right. And sometimes it will be more advantageous, especially in Lie groups coming from these computations and fluid dynamics to choose right instead of left, because then the computations get easier uh, in fact. Um, but uh, so at least when it comes to uh, um, to the uh, to the invariance relation, uh, so both give you a vector, uh, give you the same D bracket up to the split of sign. Uh, so um, um, what I want, okay. First of all, I should I should explain to you why uh, in which sense does this Lie algebra correspond to a Lie algebra associated to the Lie group, right? And um, on one hand. We also want to see that this Lie algebra is not just an abstract Lie algebra without continuity. I mean, we all know it's a locally convex space. Um, however, we still don't know that the bracket on, uh, on, this, uh, on this Lie algebra is continuous with respect to, uh, to the locally convex topology because we don't know this in general on the right hand side. Right? So, this was, uh, and so we need an argument and uh, paraphrasing what. Uh, uh, a German politician likes to say when he was young. So a uh, problem is uh, just uh, forming chance. So this is not a problem that we need our new argument for the continuity of the bracket, but it also is a nice chance to um, 
Matthew. Sorry, Matthew. No, uh, actually, one of the uh, uh, free, uh, one of the free Democrats. So he was uh, he's an entrepreneur. I think he he was something like either a lawyer or an entrepreneur. And uh, so there, there's this uh, interview where he was still uh, in school as an entrepreneur, and he was he was sort of interviewed and uh, and was just saying, oh well. Uh, I like problems because problems are just falling chances. And um, so, of course, this came, I mean, that was when it was like 17, 18 or something like this. But of course, this came up year, years later, I think he's now in his 40s, 50s or something like that. And uh, people found this interview and he was really good for no end because, of course, I mean, if you had interviewed me when I was you know, 18 and all the stuff I would have said, and uh, perhaps the ways in which I would have said it. Uh, you probably review me for all of that, but um, yeah, so uh, okay, anyway, so we have this Lisa Alpha, and I want to explain in which way uh, this gives rise to something we would call the Lee Algebra associated to uh, the Lee group. And uh, so, first of all, this is, uh, I mean, this is so that's that's true <laughs> of course uh, what i want to do is uh, i want basically a uh, description of this algebra as the tangent space at the identity so this is, this is what i'm going to set up for now so i want to get rid of all the function spaces and the <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so um, let me let me show you the first proposition. Uh, okay, again, perhaps I shouldn't write this all the time. So whenever I'm writing G now, G will be a leap, right? So whenever in this chapter capital G pops up, it will be a leap. Um, so the map. Uh, Take the tension space at the identity of your lead group and map it into the left invariant vector fields on G. Um, does it do? So it takes one of these tension vectors and maps it to uh, the left invariant field. I mean, we have seen this formula. So it's just T lambda G of G. Right. So this is a vector field, it takes points, it's sending them to the tangent space at the, uh, the space point, and we are just sort of moving with the, uh, the derivative of the left multiplication, we are just moving this E into the correct tangent space, and whatever that is, it will be the value of R that's the vector field. And this is actually, this building on this observation we had here, that the left invariant vector field is completely determined by its value at the root. Okay, and we just uh, look at this map, and uh, then we see that this uh, is an isomorphism of locally convex spaces. With inverse so if I take the left invariant vector field, this is just the value of the left invariant vector field at the end. That's a very vector field in this case with the local boundaries. As a consequence of that. Because of this isomorphism. Yes, but we already knew that. So the uh, so I mean this guy here is a locally convex uh, space as a subspace of this locally convex space. The the new information we will so we will prove this. I mean this proposition is this sort of uh, it would be a lot stronger if we already knew that we have continuity here because then we would get continuity with respect to the topology on uh, this uh, this tangent space. So um, the, the upshot is, um, uh, okay, let's, let me first introduce, uh, so we call it, uh, therefore, 
um, T1 XT uh, becomes Given the show, I want to define the presence of two elements in the tangent space and I define it to be uh, first of all the compute the vector fields and compute the uh, bracket in the uh, left finger and vector fields. So, this is the bracket of vector fields, and afterwards we evaluate whatever that is step one. So, this gives us a leaf bracket on the tangent space. Due to uh, the fact that the theta is an isomorphism of locally convex spaces, and we just declare the theta to be an isomorphism of the uh, uh, algebras, right? And everything works out. So all the identities we get, we already know, so Jacobi identity and so forth for the bracket of vector fields, they are preserved by this definition because the theta is an isomorphism of uh, vector spaces. Huh? So we, we actually get, so this really is the new bracket, which one. Bits oneself just by, by doing the usual computations with the definition. And um, okay, so we call. So, what is what is to show that uh, the left invariance of that is indeed sub algebra? Uh, I was just motivating this point when I said, well, we know we have a. Um, we have the statement that uh, relatedness of vector fields is preserved by the Lie bracket. And uh, in uh, left invariance is described as uh, vector field is left invariant if and only if it's related to itself for every lambda g. Yeah. And uh, therefore, if I take the two left invariant uh, fields, both of these fields are related to themselves using uh, uh, via by all of the lambda g's. And uh, so, therefore, their bracket is also related to itself. Uh, via all of the lambda g's, and therefore it's also left invariant. But this is sort of the proof of how you see that this is a least sub of this. Um, okay, and we call, let me introduce a new notation. So if we want to talk about uh, the D algebra structure at this tangent space, so I usually define uh, so this is L of G. Uh, if you like functors, so the L can, uh, we can. Think of the L as a factor taking B groups and spitting out B algebras. Um, we will see this in a moment. I mean, I haven't proved sort of the algebraic thing, and I haven't seen yet that uh, the L where I, I mean, one, we don't know how to apply the L to the algebra morphism. But uh, okay, so anyway, so this uh, is our new mutation. So we call this uh, with uh, bracket. And just as above, we need the algebra associated to the group. Right? Yes, this will be this will be the so we are, we are just doing sort of first, first the algebraic thing and uh, so the next uh, the next step will then be to show that this bracket is always continuous with respect to the natural topology of this and uh, so there we are coming to the following part of the chances. Uh, let's let's first have a look. So part of this will be left as an exercise. Um, because, so from the function space, the, uh, so that this mapping here is continuous, you basically have to just look at uh, how uh, it is constructed and use the usual results of function space we have with respect to the compact open the topology. And there's, uh, there's a, uh, this is, uh, there are some hints, and uh, it's not a hard exercise to see that this one is continuous. To see that the inverse is continuous, this is again point evaluation where we have fixed one point. They are continuous with respect to the compact open C infinity topology. In fact, they are even continuous with respect to the compact open topology always. So the point here, uh, when we were, why we couldn't prove 
the continuity of the bracket on this one was because we needed the full evaluation map, where we wanted to vary the uh, smooth mapping and we wanted to vary the point. If we fix one point, so this is, uh, write it, this is, we take the evaluation at one point, namely the unit of the PSS. Right? And this restricted evaluation, this one is always continuous. You don't have a problem. However, if you want to do this, I mean, with this large evaluation, like this, and usually the, pro the problem arises if you want to vary this component. If you're not fixing this and freezing this at one point, you have a problem with continuity in general for this mapping. That, that's all the, the difference why uh, we get continuity here for this one point evaluation and why it was a problem. It's really analogous to the situation that uh, what we really did to fix and find the dimension, we always smooth it mm -hmm. automatically. You do not require you do not need to put the finish. Yes. Somehow. Okay. I mean we are coming back to some related uh, questions like this a little bit later. Because, uh, as we already mentioned, the exponential map, we want to define an exponential map. Uh, however, we, we first define uh, another property, which is called regularity of the loops to do this. Um, and then it might get interesting because this is something new, which we don't have in finite dimensions. Okay, anyway, so let me uh, show you um, the proof here. Uh, okay, so let's. Let's first, let us first see that we actually get a left invariant vector field. Okay, I mean, uh, okay. Uh, so, uh, theta of um, V, and then I have a product of H and P. So, this is by definition N and lambda HG of V, and this is CG lambda of V. Uh, H P one and this of P and so this is uh, P G and the H of uh, theta uh, of G. So this is the left invariant property which shows that uh, I can take out the left multiplication with, with H. Yeah. Don't be confused. Uh, so I was just uh, before I was always writing just a tangent uh, tangent map here. So this I've I've just identified at which point we, we take the tangent, right? So nothing has changed. Here. Okay, uh, so this makes sense. Uh, and we can find this map. Basically, by this observation that uh, so it's um, why is it bijective? We know that every uh, less than very effective is uniquely defined by its value of the identity, and uh, when we uh, take less than very effective, we uh, evaluate the identity and then funnel it again through the theta and we get back to the vector field we start with. Right? So, this is uh, uh, very fast uh, bijectivity. I mean, I'm not writing that. So if that was too fast, I, uh, I would urge you to just sit down and just try to compute what happens in that uh, the theta and theta inverse are really inverse mappings to each other and then you get the bijectivity. It's not hard, but uh, I mean, it's a little bit like the snake there must be some, some things you have to prove yourself. Uh, I guess that's uh, okay. Um, uh, now, continuity uh, of theta. Let's let this an exercise. And uh, the inverse of this as point of evaluation. In this, in this, the compact open C. Okay, so um, as I said, the Lee algebra property is basically important because we use the vector space I small to pull back the, the mean bracket to something so we get so we get the Okay, so 
Uh, actually, this is uh, much less, I mean, apart from that, we have this isomorphism in vector spaces, this is much less of, a, of an interesting theorem if we, uh, since we don't get continuity automatically. If our D group G here is finite dimensional, we know that this, uh, that the D bracket on the left invariant vector is, um, is continuous with respect to the function space topologies, and this showed, I mean, basically by what we have in this, uh, in this appendix. We then know that if G is finite dimensional, this already implies the continuity of the Libre with respect to the original topology. However, the point of the next uh, next uh, thing, with, uh, sorry, the next uh, half hour, will be that um, this Libre we construct at the tangent space of the identity will always be continuous, irrespective of what is happening here on the planet. Obviously, this will then will also be continuous, but irrespective of what is happening in the larger Lie algebra of all vector fields. And so, okay, so for this, we have to work a little bit. And here comes sort of the nice part of why this work is really worthwhile and not just for a while. Okay, now we can complete continuity. So, uh, this is actually going to. Uh, uh, let, let me first start with the Misha comment. Or, From the top of my head, so I haven't thought of this uh, in, in this way. Um, we just uh, before before we start, uh, of, of I would I would think about this. I don't know uh, right now. Let me define something which might seem a little bit strange at first, and then I will give you a neat interpretation of what we mean. So let me let me build a local model of the multiplication. So uh, was it now seven? Three to eight. Uh, So, we start with the Lie group G, as always. And um, so we know that the tangent space at the identity, this is as a locally convex space, this is isomorphic to the model space of the, uh, of the manifold G, right? So, uh, So what this means is I can therefore choose a chart. Let's call this chart by this will be a chart. So I will take an open subset u phi of G. And this chart is now supposed to go to some subset B phi. And the B phi is open inside of the tangent space. How do you do this? Basically, uh, okay. there will be some more requirements, but if you have any chart going into the model space, you just compose it with the, with the isomorphism taking the model space to, to the tangent space of the identity. So I can always assume that I have a chart going into uh, this space. Okay, now I want some more properties of this chart. First of all, I want that the identity element of G, uh, that this lies in U5. And I want that my chart 
takes this identity element, um, not always consistent, one and one G are of course the same. Um, but this, is, this chart takes the identity element to zero in the tension space. This is the first requirement. And then the second requirement, I want that the tangent mapping at the identity of this chart. So this is a linear mapping. Let me just write the signature of the linear mapping. So this is going from the tangent space at the identity and takes values at the tangent space of the identity. It's a linear mapping, a continuous linear mapping. And uh, by, in a worst case, composing the chart with the, with the linear isomorphism, I may assume with all loss of generality that the tangent mapping at the identity of this phi is given as the identity of the tangent space. Right? So, I mean, whatever this linear mapping is, it's certainly invertible because the phi is a diffeomorphism, so therefore this must be a, an isomorphism of locally convex spaces. And by just, so in the worst case, if you have a chart which doesn't satisfy this, you just look at the following thing, which is also a chart in one phi inverse, composed with phi, is then a chart which has the desired property of this one. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So I have, I have this chart. These pro this second property will become important later. We'll see later why. We focus at the moment only on the first property. And uh, so I said local multiplication. What I want to do is I want to build um, a local model for the multiplication. And uh, so observe first, since our Lie group here is a topological group, uh, the multiplication is continuous. In, uh, is, yes. So the phi is going from U to B. Yes. Is go from the tangent to G to the tangent to G. Yes. Because the V phi is. Yes. Uh, Somehow you already identify the tangent to yes. U with the tangent to G. Ah, sorry, I should say, okay, let's, let's put it like this. So the signature would be T naught V phi, and this is isomorphic to. Yeah, so uh, it was before. Yes. Okay, yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, that, that's a good question. I mean, actually, if I'm writing down the signature of this guy, so formally this is not going to this one, it's going to the tangent space at the uh, image point of the unit. So this is T naught of V phi, but since V phi is open in a tangent, uh, in a vector space, it's just a vector space itself. So this is identity after all, all this. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So I'm. Uh, I want to. to uh, I want all of these identifications to uh, uh, to be included in there because that's. I mean. Uh, so we will suppress all these identifications in the following computation. Uh, and as I said, at the moment, so all what we are going to be fine now uh, will not see anything of the second bullet point. We only use the first bullet point. So um, because the G here is a topological group. I mean, I'm only in continuity of the multiplication. I can find an open neighborhood of the identity element uh, such that W multiplied with W is contained inside of the U phi. What do I mean with this notation? So, this is now set notation. This is the set of all Z. Which can be written as x times y, or, 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 or x times y, such that x and y are in W. Okay. So this is the this are all possible products you get. And note, since I assume that the unit is contained in W, this means that in particular the set of W times W uh, contains W itself. So uh, w is also contained in U phi automatically when I require this because the unit is in here. And this is just the continuity of the group multiplication I'm, uh, I'm exploiting here, and that the U phi is an open subset which already contains the unit. Right. Okay, now what we can do, we can define the star 
and the star is something which goes from the image of phi, uh, w, by w, and takes values in B phi, and thus it also takes values in the tangent space of G. And so what it does, I take two elements, A and B, and I send them, I send them to uh, what, A star of B, and I define this as, first of all, we are pulling back A using the chart, and we're pulling back B using the chart. We can multiply these two things. So those are group elements. We can multiply them using group multiplication. By definition, because we are in the image of the W, pulling this guy back, we, uh, so this is an element in W, this is an element in W. So the product lies in W times W, therefore it lies in group 5. So we are still in the chart domain, and we can then reapply our chart to the whole thing and get something which lies then in B5. What this does is we have localized our multiplication of the Lie group inside of this chart. And this is what is called a local multiplication. And so it makes sense to, I mean, this is a well defined product on uh, this open subset of the Cartesian product of uh, B5 with itself. And uh, this uh, note that if I take zero, star A, this then, okay, if we're inserting zero here, we get phi inverse of zero. Phi inverse of zero is the unit. Multiplying the unit with phi inverse of E, we get phi inverse of E. Applying phi, phi inverse of E, you get E. Okay, I'm oh, sorry, sure it's E here. So this is E. And the other way around, this also comes out. Yeah. So zero gets to be the unit with respect to this localized star product. And I will, I will soon show you what, uh, what the advantage of having that. Um, so actually, this guy gives us something which is called, or this gives rise to something which is called a local Lie group. Obviously, um, the star is smooth. Because we just constructed from the multiplication, which is smooth, and the chart, which is also smooth. Okay. What is a local Lie group? I mean, it, uh, we have a group product on, uh, on the full Lie group. This looks like a group product. It satisfies all the nice axioms we have there. Unfortunately, we can in general not form iterated products of the, of the star because uh, we know that W times W is in here. But what happens if we take another product, so W times W times another W, this might not be contained in group 5. So it might be ill-defined to take several stars here. Uh, so A star, B star, C or something might just not be defined. And a local group, I mean, the Lee just tells you that the, the group operations are smooth. A local group is something uh, which is defined, so you have a set, and the composition is just defined on some, on some, some set. And uh, the composition rule, which is the, given by the star, satisfies all the group axioms as long as the composition is well defined, right? So if uh, it's defined, to, for example, so it's defined to take R, A star, B star, C, then the local group axioms say, if this is defined, then you need to have then also uh, the following iterate product is defined. Where, so the associativity condition, and you, uh, so if the left hand side is defined compared to the right hand side, needs to be defined by local group, and you need to have equality behind, uh, between those two things. And this is this gives rise to a so-called locally. I mean, this construction of the star gives rise to a locally group. And now, so we are we are sort of arrived at the meta common. We will use this local product to show that the Lie brackets actually continues. But before we do that, uh, let me let me. Uh, so a comment again, yesterday I was always uh, a bit excited about sort of uh, the uh, association of a Lie algebra to uh, a Lie group. So we have actually, if you want, the three levels of, uh, of Lie theory. So, 
So we have the global level. And this is the leaf condition, right? Well, I mean, this picture is now picturing uh, the manifold, right? So we have, at some point, we have the unit of G here in this, uh, in this manifold. I mean, manifolds look like these of uh, stuff going along, right? So then we get the local level. We have the charge domain here. So, um, and uh, so in here, by just restricting our group multiplication to a small set and localizing this in the chart, we get something which is the local level. This corresponds to constructing the local group. And in principle, what you expect, I mean, obviously, once you have a once you have a, a group, you can always sort of construct the local group by choosing the sets, right? Choosing the, the chart, right? So you get a local group, right? So you're losing, in a certain sense, you're losing some sort of information. I mean, the global level basically has all the information of the new group. Then you're restricting to the local level and you lose some information, say, about the topology of the group or something. I mean, if there, so the new group may have several connected components, for example, and obviously this local group cannot see the other connected components, which are not uh, connected components at the identity, right? Um, so, for example, so you, there's, there's sort of a reduction of information when going from the global group to the local group. Um, okay, and then finally, now I have to basically uh, uh, draw sort of bundle here. I mean, upstairs we have the TG bundle. You know that this is a new group. However, so one of the fibers of the uh, of this bundle, so this will be the fiber at the identity, and this is the infinitesimal level. So those are the, uh, the three levels of the theory. Obviously, once you have the leaf group, you get local level, and we have now seen that you get also this infinitesimal level by constructing some of this leaf. We want to see that, uh, that it's actually a locally convex. However, sort of the success story of the theory is built to a certain, uh, uh, to a large extent on the following observation, which is not really of the we're getting more to how these levels are connected. Obviously, I can always, when I start here, I can go to the local level. If I'm at the local level, I can basically do this derivation process and also go to the infinitesimal level. We do that for the local level in a moment. Right? So, uh, it's always possible from to go from local to local to infinitesimal. And the strong, I mean, up here, we are basically in the realm of linear algebra, possibly now in the infinite dimension, also with, with the addition of topology. And uh, so, the, one of the, uh, the, the theorems in the theory are that uh, under certain circumstances, you can recover. Information on, say, for example, the global level from just knowing the information on the infinitesimal level. So, they, these, I mean, uh, sort of the, the flow of this, we assume that there's a huge loss of the information when going from downstairs to upstairs, right? So, the upstairs, upstairs level potentially lose a lot of information we have uh, available on the global level. And it turns out that under certain assumptions, especially if the little groups are finite dimension, then you have an extremely strong connection of the infinitesimal and also of the local level back to the global level. So you can always, uh, at least say in finite dimensions, recover a lot of the information on your E group uh, by studying the infinitesimal level. And this is sort of why E theory is very successful because you know, many tools might be very complicated as, as long as we want to study, for example, the uh, classification results. But the algebras are much more amenable to uh, classification because we have linear structures, you have these brackets to classify those things. This works very, very nicely in finite dimensions. In infinite dimensions, there are more obstacles. Let's put it like this. We'll talk about this later. So, this will be sort of uh, uh, the last thing we're doing. And we just uh, got a hint at how you construct the local level here by using this localized multiplication. And now I want to explain how this localized multiplication can help us understand 
that the new bracket we have constructed on the tangent space of the identity is actually continuous. Right? And this is sort of the reason why we are looking at this local level. Apart from that, we have this nice picture of the three levels of the theory. Okay. So let's, uh, let's prove this. That, uh, well, let's, let, let's explain what this local multiplication has to do with um, the E bracket. Actually, I want, basically, I want to explain to you now here are the local Lie group. How do you construct the Lie algebra associated to this local Lie group? And we are saying, well, if you have a Lie group, we take left invariant vector fields. Now, with the local Lie group, let's just try with the local version of left invariant vector fields and see what happens. So first of all, we probably need to explain what is a left invariant vector field with respect to the star product. Well, we will get something, some vector field, which is then only defined on this open subset phi of W because we need the multiplication. We cannot extend this to all of the tangent space at the NMP, but uh, it's not necessary to do this. Recall when we were doing the Lie bracket of uh, Lie bracket of vector fields. Um, so the Lie bracket of vector fields sees basically the whole space, the whole vector, what the vector field is doing in the whole um, space. But since we are doing invariant vector fields, actually when we compute the Lie bracket, we are only interested of the value of the Lie bracket at one single point, namely the identity, or in this case, we are interested at the, the, of the Lie bracket of the left invariant vector field, which is left invariant with respect to the local product, at the identity which is the zero. And the zero lies conveniently inside of the set, so we can actually compute the bracket for these vectors. Okay. So let's see. First of all, let us, I want to distinguish here a little bit between left multiplication with respect to our new star product and left multiplication with respect to uh, the product on the new group. This is not always done. Um, so, however, let me just introduce a small uh, x, and this will now be a uh, mapping defined on phi of w. It takes values if you want uh, to be phi, and what it does, it takes y and sends this to x. So, y, and of course, we do form x. Which is so, this is sort of the local version of the left translation operation. Right. And then uh, uh, we can define our vector field, or let's say the D and the tangent space of the identity via the following formula. So we give this a new name, lambda D. This is something which eats uh, points in here and spits out tangent vectors or spits out vectors. And this is a smooth, a little bit smooth mapping. And what it does, it uh, sends an x to Lx, the derivative of Lx at zero. And then I insert the D here. This is the local work. The formula, when you look at this in manifold language, this is exactly the same formula we had for uh, the left invariant vector field. So, this is what this theta mapping was doing. Right? However, we are using now the left multiplication to respect the star. Yeah, so, this is, this is a local thing, and this is what the left invariant vector field should be. So, we can compute a Lie bracket with respect to these vector fields. Why is this interesting? And now, here comes the sort of the point. We need to connect these left invariant vector fields to the left invariant vector fields on our uh, on our Lie group, and this is an exercise which is very nice, and we'll certainly do this today in the exercise session because it's uh, exercise. Let x be left vector fields on with um, 
and the value of the identity is b equal to b. Right? Then the local representative of this vector field x in the chart phi. So this is the chart we use to construct this local product the star. If I restrict this to phi of w, I will well, you will see that this is given by this local left invariant vector field. So basically what I've just shown you is um, we've constructed uh, we've constructed the local representative of a left invariant vector field is exactly this local left invariant vector field. So and then there's a computation. So this is not for free. You need to basically crawl through what does this mean? Uh, how is this product defined? What uh, happens if I take derivatives of this um, of this uh, this phi here? Let me just before uh, okay. So we will need this. Let me just explain to you uh, a nice way to define uh, this value. So what I claim here is that this is actually uh, b b t zero of um, of x star t v. Okay, let's let's uh, let's have a look. Why is this the case? So the derivative of uh, so we know um, that our mapping Lx is uh, differentiable, fair enough, and we can think of this as being the vector component. I mean, in, uh, in manifold language, what is this guy? Let me just write it in that manifold language. So this is. In many code language, this guy is T naught. So we take the tangent map at the identity of this mapping Lx and we apply it to the B. Why am I writing this more complicated than you? The reason is because we already know how to compute these tangent mappings. What I need to do to compute a tangent mapping, I need to take um, I need to take a path or a curve representing this tangent vector, and then I need to apply. So I need to do the following is true. So I need to take C. I need to apply the L x to um, a curve. Let's, let me just write C of T, where the C of T is a curve which at T equal to zero is zero and whose derivative is b and this is actually much more complicated uh, than need be i mean we we are in, a, in an open subset of vector space we know a curve which runs over, uh, through zero in the direction of v and so this curve is just t times v okay and what is this equivalence class I mean, we can write out what is this Lx of Tv. This is x star Tv. Aha. And now, if we identify the class, we just see that it's take the derivative of this guy, set t equal to zero. Okay. So this somewhat convoluted thing, I was basically motivating why we can uh, can construct this by recursion to uh, to we how we define tangent mappings. I mean, this is also true for the for the derivative. Okay, so this gives us a very nice formula for the left invariant vector field, and this formula is true now because we are on a, a vector space. If we were on the D group, we would need a chart to actually transform this nice path T V to some path which uh, runs around in the uh, uh, in the D group. Okay, good. So. Uh, Basically, what this exercise tells us is the local representatives of left invariant vector fields are given by those. So 
or in other words, I can say the, look, uh, the left invariant vector field is related, is phi related, where phi is the chart, to these local left invariant vector fields. And this is what we were after. So, exploiting the relatedness condition, I know now how to express my leap rent. Okay, let's see. Okay, so I have the lead record of W and W. So this is the lead record on the tension space of the identity. By definition, this is the lead record of the left invariant field constructed from B with the leap bracket of the left invariant field constructed by W evaluated in one. I know that this left invariant field is phi related to the field lambda B. I know that this left invariant field is phi related to lambda W. And so I'm just exploiting the relatedness condition and the fact that this one here is phi inverse of zero. Actually, uh, so you recall from the relatedness condition, so x is related to y if t f was f, uh, f related to this t phi if uh, so this is the relatedness condition. Okay. However, uh, we see we are only interested in this relatedness condition at a very special point, namely at the identity. And here comes now the second uh, bullet point, what we require for our chart. You don't see the T phi here. I mean, what I want to write out, and this is so what we get here is this is lambda V, lambda W in zero. And the reason why you don't see in any of the formulas that T phi is actually to believe that T phi only at, the, at one point, namely at the identity. And we require uh, no, the units. And we require that T one phi is the identity of T one G. So therefore, I'm not writing this. It's actually there. I haven't just written it off because it's just the identity. So we're using we're using in this formula that we have a very special chart, so we don't need to carry this. Right. Okay. Now finally, we can write what this is. I mean, what is this leap bracket now of these local fields? We just define this exactly as the, I mean as we would define the leap bracket. So this is V lambda W of uh, zero lambda V of zero. Minus B lambda B zero lambda W zero. Okay. And now we have our formula for lambda B at this one. We want to derivate it another time. And when you do the same trick, so here we have the derivation of the second component of this guy. However, now the second derivation we're getting from this D will be a derivation with respect to the first component. So if you carefully work out how these derivatives are defined, you get the following formula. I mean, we could actually stop here. This already shows that the leap bracket is, uh, um, is continuous, right? Because these lies here are continuous in everything we've written down, because uh, we see uh, that this is a continuous mapping. Uh, sorry, it's actually a smooth mapping. If we derivate it another time, it will still be smooth, so it still continues. So this is here. This is already enough to deduce the continuity of the leap bracket now in the variables v and w. And this is this is sort of the the, uh, the main point that we want to in v and w. Uh, however, I'm giving the nice formula because this is frequently very useful if you don't know an explicit formula for the leap bracket and want to compute this. Uh, if you have access to this local product, so what you get is 
So you don't need uh, basically you, you don't have to be able to go uh, uh, to, to solve this the, the certain differential equation in every direction uh, and to hit everything downstairs here. Uh, we have a well-defined peak record, also a well-defined exponential on uh, on the D, uh, on the D algebra. Yeah, so the the leap loop exponential will be defined as a finite dynamic case on the whole Lie algebra. It's only that the image of the exponential is bad, so to speak. If you don't know what I'm talking about, so you <laughs> say that your phi is well defined. Yes. So uh, yes. So this phi here, I mean, I'm using. So in finite dimensions, you would be always tempted to take as phi. Uh, the exponential set and exponential coordinates. Yes. I am not assuming this here. So the phi has a priori nothing to do with the exponential. It's just a chart. It's just a chart. So this is, this is only a manifold chart, and I can always massage my manifold chart such that it satisfies all of these properties which I have there. Yes. Sorry, I was uh, misunderstanding your question. Yes. Okay. And uh, okay, so if you have not heard about this exponential method, we will define it later. Does that mean that the model space for the uh, space, uh, the kind of space that I think is nothing more than that? Okay. Just substitute the model space. Exactly. Okay. So let's. Um... Okay, and I mean, as a, as a corollary, what we get from all of this is the Lie algebra associated to a Lie group is always a locally convex Lie algebra. That's a correlation. Yes, sorry, I can also write it. Uh, And the associated Lie algebra is uh, locally complex algebra. And the meaning of this is this guy, which is a tangent space at identity by definition, is a locally convex space, and the bracket is continuous with respect to this structure. So we the only additional information compared to the, the original proposition we had with the left invariant vector fields is that we uh, now know that this bracket is continuous. Okay. And now, uh, okay. Um, yeah. So let me uh, let me motivate a little bit. So actually. I want to define something which is usually called the Lie functor. So it takes Lie groups. So this is the category of Lie functor groups. Have, uh, is, is everybody familiar with what, what, what is the category? Somebody who hasn't seen categories? Okay. So basically, this means uh, this means so there's uh, so the object. Uh, so basically, it's a bunch of objects. So and the objects are possibly infinite dimensional. So categories consist of objects and an assortment of morphisms between them, and they should satisfy the usual rules you would expect from uh, so the morphisms of the Those are usual. More business. I mean, uh, so and right. so let me, let me uh, so the point here is the categorical point of view says okay, it's important if you if you're talking uh, so the traditional point of view of uh, uh, say for example you do Hilbert or Banach space theory was well okay Hilbert and Banach space is important in studying those things and then you are studying the objects and category theory shifts the point of view a little bit and says well. If you are studying objects, it's equally important to also study the morphisms in your category uh, on equal footing in a, in a certain sense, right? So the morphism spaces in the category play a, play a role, 
and uh, category theory has this universal language where um, so a functor L will be uh, with this V functor. This will be something which assigns to every object, so to every E group, it assigns an object in another category. And the category is, uh, so perhaps I should write locally convex Lee Island class. So actually, the objects in this category over here, they are. Uh, uh, so over here, they are locally convex D algebra, as the name is, uh, says, and the morphisms, uh, morphisms of this, those are um, continuous algebra morphisms. And then we, we call so a D algebra morphism is a linear map F, which if you apply it to, let's say, a Lee bracket, this means it commutes with the knee. This is the knee, uh, more, uh, the knee algebra morphism. So it basically is bracket preserving. That's, uh, I mean, as usual, we want to preserve whatever structure you have there. Okay. And um, so we want to define this knee functor. And uh, on knee groups, we already know what to do. So a uh, functor needs to be defined as uh, on, on objects and on morphisms, and it needs to uh, satisfy certain compatibility conditions. So uh, if we have a lead group G on objects, this is here. So if I have an infinite, possibly infinite dimensional lead group, what does the functor do? Well, it just sends it to the associated lead algebra together with the second, and we have seen that this is a well-defined uh, thing. Okay, and now, if, it's, if this really can be made into a functor, I need to explain to you how do you cook up from a Lie group morphism a Lie algebra morphism. So there must be a way, this functor, I mean, functors are basically mappings which take, which do something on objects and they do something related on, uh, on the morphisms. So let's assume for a moment we have, uh, we have a Lie group morphism. Let's call this psi. The Lie group morphism is a nice root homomorphism smooth from a Lie group G with values to a Lie group H. And uh, so I want to define now a Lie algebra morphism we call L of phi. So this should be what the functor does on the psi. Sorry, L of psi. So this should be what the functor does on the psi. And uh, this should then be, on one hand, I mean, this is a covariant functor. Uh, so in case you, uh, you have heard about covariant functors, so what the Lie algebra morphism or the signature of the Lie algebra morphism should be of the following type. So it should go from the Lie algebra associated to G and should take values in the Lie algebra associated to H. Okay, so we need to cook up somehow from this Lie group morphism a Lie algebra morphism. Uh, and we, uh, this one should, uh, it should not only be a Lie algebra, but it should also be continuous. So let's, uh, so how do you do this? And this is, um, uh, I, uh, I will tell you in the next dilemma, I guess. Yes. So we have to first this dilemma. Let me let us prove the lemma first, and then we fill in here what the functor is doing. So the point of the point of having a functor is uh, actually the functor, one of the functorial conditions is. I mean, this is not just an arbitrary map which takes objects, spits out objects, takes morphisms, spits out morphisms, but it satisfies some compatibility conditions. So, for example, I have psi composed with uh, another name for a functor uh, for group morphism. Uh, um, psi. 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 Then, if it's a functor, it must satisfy the following rule. So, if you have the composition of two group of uh, morphisms, you must have uh, psi composed. Uh, psi. Right? So, it needs to respect the composition. Um, sorry, I'm butchering this a lot. 
so this is sort of the, the poor man's introduction to what a functor is, right? So it, it has all kinds of nice properties. Um, and so let, let me let me show you the lemma what the element of f will be. So if uh, f h is uh, the group for morphism, then we find L of F. We define this at the, as a tangent map of the identity of F. This is then because the tangent space of the identity of G is the B algebra of G. It goes to the B algebra of H. So this will be the result of our uh, what the functor is giving us. So uh, this guy here will be T1 of psi. Okay, since F is smooth, this is a continuous linear map check, right? This is good. What we don't know yet doesn't respect the Liebrecht. And this is something we need to prove. Okay, so uh, uh, define one and uh, uh, what LF is uh, morphism of. Locally, Usually, I will always say it's a Lie algebra morphism, and just stressing here the locally convex again because continuity is important, right? So it's a locally convex Lie algebra morphism. If uh, on one hand it's a Lie algebra morphism and it's continuous. Continuity and linearity are clear basically from the disconstruction because we know that the tangent map at one point is continuous linear, and so we basically have to prove that this guy respects the lead bracket. Okay, so let's let's take a look um, and uh, okay. So let us look at uh, a point B and D one of G set the tilde as T1 F of E. So we are looking at this one. And the every sum a little bit of preparatory work. Uh, so since F is a group for morphism, what we get. So I'm interested in what happens. If we construct the left invariant vector field now on the group H. With respect to this V tilde. And let's evaluate this at f of uh, some point f of this point of g. So by definition, this is and this, so this is a left invariant group. Uh, this is T e, lambda Fg. So we are left shifting with the element f of g of what? Of v tilde. Okay. So this is just the definition of what this field does. If I'm handling it uh, as a group element, it's you evaluate the field. So this is actually a nice of h. Right. This gives me to or in other words, it is P one of T and P one F of T. Right? So we have this window dressing for one. Okay. And now what we see here is uh, since the F is a group homomorphism, so an easy exercise to see that um, well, so for example, using again uh, the what is this tangent map, it's the same as what we take the curve of t goes to uh, c of t, where c of zero gets you gives you the identity, the derivative at the identity is exactly v. So what is t1 of f? It's the equivalence class of f composed with this. Uh, if, we, if I want to look at this guy, then then I have to left multiply with f of g. So the result of this is the equivalence class of 
Now when t goes to f of g multiplied with f of that one. Okay. And now the f is a group morphism. So if I have f of g times f of whatever this guy in the, in the bracket is, it's the same as f of g times c of t. Right. And uh, okay, therefore, uh, what we get out of this is uh, it is t uh, f of the vector field uh, which I hook up from the left invariant vector field and field. Why is that? So if we derivate this chain rule, we get tf applied to what? To uh, the more space here. So if I derivate this one, I get tf of applied to the curve t and uh, this is the same as lambda uh, g. And if I derivate that one, I get exactly the formula for the left invariant field. Even by that one, ah, sorry, should have said at the end. Okay, what does this show us? Well, we just so not a unit S G. This is the point. What this shows us is the left invariant vector with respect to V tilde is F related to the left invariant vector field with respect to the V. Now this is just the relation this condition we have just computed. Okay. And now if we know this, um, well. So now I want to look at this one. I want to look at L F of E, L F of W, the bracket of this. By definition, this bracket is given by we take the bracket of the invariant vector fields depending on these guys, right? So we see that the invariant vector fields are F related to the invariant, uh, invariant vector fields of the original one. And what this means is, since, in, uh, since relatedness is preserved by the bracket, this just means that we get this is TF of the bracket of B and W. Okay, and this is the proof why uh, the here actually I have T1. Uh, so this is the proof that um, the, or in other words, this is L of F. And this is the proof that, they, uh, that this mapping we have here actually preserves the Lie bracket. Basically boils down to related this con uh, computation. Okay, and then we are done. So we actually get uh, this mapping, which is well defined on the objects of our category. So it checks the groups. Turns out Lie algebras. It takes morphisms of Lie groups and turns out uh, Lie algebra homomorphisms. Um, and it's compatible in a very nice way. I mean, this formula is evident from the definition of the L of F. Right? So it's clear because we have the chain rule tangent mappings will preserve uh, this, uh, this composition. This is just the chain. Okay. Now we still have a little bit of time. So we have this Lie functor, and which explains how the category of Lie theory, uh, sorry, the category of Lie groups, is connected to the category of Lie algebras. And before we, uh, the way yes, the other way around is the problem. <laughs> I mean, as you might expect. So what is what is basically happening when taking this Lie functor? We're basically taking a derivative, and taking derivatives is easy. So as long as you know that stuff is the differential, you can always take derivatives. Uh, in finite dimensions, it's already, I mean, it becomes more challenging if you have a derivative and want to hook up sort of the, uh, the original mapping, you integrate, right? 
So and this is why often uh, the converse direction going from the category of locally convex Lie algebras to the category of Lie groups is uh, called an integ uh, the integration function. Unfortunately, uh, the converse direction of going from here to there is not well defined. So uh, you can give examples of infinite dimensional Lie algebras which do not arise as the algebras of infinite dimensional groups. Yeah, so uh, this basically means that this functor here is not surjective on the objects. Right? So there are infinite dimensional Lie algebras which do not arise as the algebras of Lie of groups. In finite dimensions, this cannot happen. In fin uh, all, every finite dimensional Lie algebra uh, arises. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, yeah, yeah. I mean, but, but still, at least in finite dimensions, this is very uh, well behaved. So, yes, I mean, we are, we are basically, to a certain extent, we are not discussing the reverse function because it's getting very technical and messy. But, uh, I mean, it's, it's a good question. So, in finite dimensions, the world is much nicer. So, if I restrict here to finite dimension units, finite dimension the algebras, I have a much better chance of getting something like in the converse direction. In infinite dimensions, things are very, very messy. So there are classical examples by people uh, of uh, Lie algebras which do not come from Lie groups. Um, yeah, and, uh, I mean, there's always something topological going on here, uh, which I'm also in this general. So um, this is more like a play discussion when I, mean, I talk about the, uh, the integration. So usually there's also some topological properties connected to you being able to reverse the errors. So there are, there are two more things I want to be doing and then we're done with this check. So we'll probably get into this in the next half hour. The first uh, thing is I want to describe the Lie algebra of the diffeomorphism group. We saw yesterday, at least I came, that the diffeomorphism group is an infinite dimensional Lie group. And um, I wanted to identify the Lie algebra of this diffeomorphism group. And the second thing, perhaps we do that after lunch, let's see, is um, I want to talk a little bit about the classical Lie theorems, which provide some answers under which condition you can go back from the infinitesimal level of the D algebra to the global level of the D group, or what kind of results you can expect when you want to reverse this differentiation process. And uh, this will lead to a condition which is called regularity of the groups. Let's have a look. I mean, the main issue why everything gets complicated in infinite dimensions and why I haven't yet defined, so for example, the exponential map is um, because in this generalized setting we are, uh, we have a problem of solving ordinary differential equations. So we call the lecture of y y back there. Um, uh, we have seen spaces on which even very benign linear ordinary differential equations didn't have solution. And this integration process can basically be framed also as you want to be able to solve certain ordinary differential equations and you don't necessarily know. Uh, it's, not, it's not entirely that, but it's, it's an important part. Okay, so let us um, identify the Lie algebra of, uh, let's see. Okay. Let's give another example. And this is one of the instances where it's actually advantages of uh, using right and very effective fields and left and very points. And that's coming back to Hans' uh, uh, comment here. So we have to assume that M is a compact manifold. Yes? Uh, 
Yes, <laughs> I can, but so the, the point is, uh, okay. so we have, uh, so we always discuss, because we are only discussing functions based on compact sources, uh, this was the reason why we are only considering the diffeomorphism groups in infinite dimension E group when the source is compact, right? Okay. However, also for the small expression in group M non. Okay. And this might be worthwhile as a comment anyway, because we sometimes read in the literature that if the manifold M is non compact, then this, I mean, you can always define this group just, uh, of diffeomorphism as long as your manifold is smooth, you can define smooth diffeomorphisms, and they always carry a group structure with respect to composition. But you sometimes read, and I see this often in discussions today on mass overflow or something, and people claim that if the underlying manifold M is non compact, then uh, there is no lead group structure on, on this group, and this is not right. Uh, so the point is that uh, if your space is non compact, then I mean, you basically want to still model uh, the diffeomorphism as some sort of sub, uh, subset of the smooth functions. Mm -hmm. right? Talk about just real ones. Yeah, okay, I mean, it doesn't, actually it doesn't matter, it doesn't get easier to take the, not entirely true, but, uh, well, okay, I mean, uh, but, but mostly the difficulties are, uh, are already all there for the real line. Huh? So the, the first problem is that this function space, we have always thought that studied the compact open C infinity topology, which turned out to be the manifold topology, if the M is compact. If M is non-compact, the compact open C infinity topology is the wrong topology. It doesn't turn this guy here into a manifold. You have to take much finer topology, which is, uh, in case you've seen function space topologies, they are the so-called Whitney topologies. And even the Whitney topologies are not fine enough to control this. So you have to even refine the Whitney topology, something which is depending on who you ask. So I think Michor calls this in his book the uh, uh, the fine F, uh, the FD topology, whatever that is, it's a refinement from the whole Whitney topology. If you don't know what that is, just ignore the remark. Okay. However, this is an extremely fine topology, and what happens in this topology? So you get the diffeomorphisms uh, of M, which are compactly supported. What do I mean by compactly supported for a diffeomorphism? This means the uh, diffeomorphism phi from M to M is compactly supported if uh, there exists a compact subset in M uh, such that if I look at phi restricted to everything outside of the compact subset, it is the identity. So basically, I want uh, to, uh, so it's compact supported if outside of some compact set it doesn't do anything, it just stays the identity. And it turns out that this much finer topology turns this compactly supported diffeomorphism into an open subgroup of uh, all diffeomorphisms. And what you do then is uh, you basically prove that this guy here is a new group. So this becomes the identity component of the. Uh, the, of your diffeomorphism group here. And its Lie algebra is given by vector fields on M, which are compactly supported. And now compactly supported means a more traditional thing. There is a compact set on which the vector field may differ from zero, and outside of this compact, uh, compact set must be zero. So this is the Lie algebra, again with the same bracket we have been discussing. And um, so the topology of this Lie algebra is much finer than the compact open C infinity topology. So it's a very fine topology. And uh, so this, um, I mean, what, uh, once we have that this is the identity component, you can basically show there's a nice trick we will see um, later, or perhaps tomorrow. Uh, if you can basically uh, construct, uh, if you have a manifold, uh, so the M will be a, uh, will be a manifold. And you know, we have a knee group structure at the identity component of this manifold, and then you can move it around. Uh, so, actually, this structure turns uh, the full diffeomorphism group also into a knee group. And for many people don't like it. I mean, I had a, a co author who said this is a, this is a horrible structure because um, 
from a physical point of view, many people want to uh, want the algebra of the diffeomorphism to be all uh, vector fields. And this is something you can't have. So um, I probably I shouldn't comment now on the on the Lie group exponential because we haven't introduced this. But uh, for those who know the Lie group exponential, the Lie group exponential of the diffeomorphism group is the map which associates to a vector field the time one flow of the vector field. And if you don't have compactly supported, you can find uh, in any sensible function space topology vector fields arbitrarily near to the zero vector field which explode before their flow reaches time one. And this is the reason why it's impossible to model uh, the diffeomorphism group as, a, as an infinite dimension group on all vector fields. Um, at least if you want an exponential one. Okay. And the only connected components? Infinitely many. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this, uh, this, has, this is a ton of, uh, I think it's probably uncountably many uh, connected components. Yeah. Okay, so let's, uh, if you don't know this stuff, then, uh, then just ignore it. So this is, uh, I mean, it's, it's important to know this always is a leap group. Basically, I mean, I should say if M is a finite dimension, yeah, so we, are, we are investing a little bit here in finite dimensionality. Yeah, I mean, this is sort of an avoid comment for 99% of all mathematicians, but if you're doing infinite dimension geometry, then um, you get this habit of assuming that everything might be. Okay, now compact manifold, and we want to identify the Lie algebra of uh, the vector fields. And um, okay, let's uh, let's first recall two things, and I think once we're done with this, it's time for lunch. Uh, so, on one hand, what we so the manifold structure is basically identified this as an open subset, the C infinity function from M. Okay, now I have to, if I want to compute the least of uh, M, so as a space, this is the tangent space of the digital morphism group. At the identity element, this is the identity element of this group is just the identity of the real morphism. Okay, so since diff is an open subset here, I can also be very right that this is the tenth vector identity, identity of this. And now recall that yesterday we had this identification what is the tangent space of this manifold of mappings? It's isomorphic to the C infinity functions from M. With values in Tm, which sit over the mapping where we've computed the tangent space, which sit over the identity. So we take all smooth mappings which, after projection from Tm down to M, give us the identity. In other words, those are the vector fields on M. Right. And you can actually make, uh, you can actually prove that the topology of this space coincides with the topology we, we considered yesterday. Right. Um, okay, so just as a locally convex space, this calculation shows that we can identify, and there's an identification which I'm not writing out, but the identification here is that the tangent space at the identity of the vector fields can be identified, with, uh, so the tangent space at the identity of the diffeomorphism group can be identified with vector fields. So what the upshot of all of this work should be is the Lie algebra uh, of the diffeomorphism group is the Lie algebra of vector fields. And now comes sort of the thing which leads to confusion to no end. Uh, the Lie bracket, which we defined yesterday, is not the correct Lie bracket. We are basically have to flip. Uh, so there's a flip in the, uh, you have to change the sign. Uh, so it's basically the Lie bracket of vector fields we saw yesterday up to multiplication with minus one. Okay, and the reason for this is we are computing with right invariant vector fields now. And we'll turn out that the right invariant vector fields basically uh, give you the Lie bracket uh, we computed yesterday. And um, so there's an exercise. If you compute the Lie bracket of uh, a Lie group using right invariant vector fields, then the Lie bracket comes out with the wrong sign. And you can also see the uh, look at this in the problem. So, yes. Uh, the of the group on itself, on the left, then you get the right and the right the field in the other way around. Yes, exactly. So here yeah. they okay, so compose, then we have a left action. And then we take the, yeah. the image of the right. So you see that Irina was already on 
<laughs> so, so, yeah. I spend a lot of time trying to understand this weird stuff. There is also because when you find a crash like that, it means you can do it by the way, you need to put it back. Yes, that's composed from the variant there. So if you put it back with F and G, you can say that's put it back on and G goes to that. So there's a small. So if you if you don't know what, what what all of this was about, we we do now argument, which is sort of uh, which which will show, uh, sort of show us what the bracket is and, and why it is. And then we have in the early days of integrated integration, we had a we had a trick. If you are integrated, it doesn't work. Change the sign of the bracket. Okay. So our goal here is to show. Uh, is that the D bracket of uh, um, so the D bracket for X and Y is uh, uh, for the D group negative. And with usual bracket, I mean the, the guy in time right? Um, and so this there's this beautiful argument. So this is why you always why you often find that if you look at the uh, if you look at the uh, um Lee alpha of this this then then you will find this usually you know you know by something like this. So you take back the field to n and then you take minus bracket where the understanding is that this bracket is the usual bracket of vector fields, right? And this is the, the minus sign you get here. Okay, and uh, so this this argument here uh, basically follows a classical argument by John Milner. So John Milner has written this a very nice paper in the 80s which is called Remarks of Infinite Dimension Groups. And there he has this very nice argument. I'm not entirely sure whether this is originally due to him, but uh, probably not. But uh, at least I learned it from John Newman's paper. And we call that we have this section alpha on uh, M, and it's given by um, alpha of sigmoid and plus evaluation. So this is a smooth action. Because we know that the evaluation and the situation is smooth, and we've just restricted it to an open subset of the of all the C infinity functions. So this is a smooth leak detection. Okay. Now, um, x uh, right is there. Then? Rx on this looks weird now because where well, this x is a vector field on M, and I want to extend to something to another vector field. So the whole point here is, and this is what one has to wrap one's head about. So whenever you're working with these manifolds of mappings, ma uh, smooth maps on the finite dimension manifold become points in our infinite dimension manifold. Therefore, though this here is already a vector field on, on M, it is a point in the tangent space at the identity of this diffeomorphism group. Right? And so, um, I mean, the formula here, uh, how do you do this? Um, the formula is once you look at that, and so what is Rx of phi? It turns out that this is just you take a vector field and compose it with the phi. So this is this is now so this takes the two morphisms. So the Rx is now of phi, it takes the two morphisms. And spits out things in the tangent bundle of the diffeomorphism group. And this tangent bundle can be identified as a subset of the tangent bundle. So it's an open subset of the tangent bundle, smooth function from M to M. Or, in other words, we know we can identify this tangent bundle. What is this tangent bundle? This is the smooth.
two times from M. And therefore, it makes sense to consider this as a right invariant equity. So this is of the right type because we get nothing from M with values in T. Okay, now, um, okay, what we want to do now, um, so we have now our right invariant vector field, and we want to build a vector field on diff m times m, which we, and then we uh, do something with this action. So the Rx lives on the vector fields of diff m. Okay, fair enough. Um, now, how do I bring this action into play? So this is a smooth map, and I want to play with the action. I want to compute a related this condition with the action. However, if we just see this as a smooth map, what the relatedness condition will be, we need a vector field which lives not only in diff m but also on m itself. Okay, how do we do this? Where we achieve? We just do the Cartesian product of this vector field with the zero vector field. This is now a vector field on the m times m. If we are taking the product of two vector fields, then you get a vector field of the product magnitude. Okay. And now let's compute what is the tangent of alpha applied to the field Rx times zero m evaluated in phi m. Okay, so let's let's compute what, what this gives us. Now we take the definition. So we have T alpha of we have to evaluate the Rx in phi. This is x composed of phi. Now times 0m applied to this small m gives us the zero element in the m here. Okay, fair enough. Now let's derivate this. And we know that the alpha function here is just the restriction of the evaluation. And in the vector space case, we have a nice formula for the uh, for the derivative of the evaluation map. And you can prove a similar formula in uh, the case where you have an honest manifold. This is again an exercise because I think we want to digest this one needs to do this oneself. Uh, so uh, there's no. Um, if you do this, what is happen, what is the outcome of this? So it turns out if you derivate the evaluation map. In the vector space case, sort of the derivation, the derivative of the evaluation map uh, was uh, at something like uh, uh, gamma m, and then this was, uh, let's say, f uh, e or something like that. We got something which looks like um, gamma. Of M plus uh, T. Uh, what what I mean here? Ah. Ah. I'm not sure if that. So we had a formula which basically uh, I can't recollect. Let me let me just show you what, what it looks what it reads like in this case. Okay, so it is on one hand, so the first the thing stays the same. Uh, sorry, uh, yes, I need to uh, yeah, okay. So it's x composed with phi evaluated at m. You take the base point, insert it in this guy. And then, so this is the uh, derivative with respect to the second component plus uh, T phi evaluated in zero m. So this is you derivate with respect to this component with respect to the phi. This keeps a derivative on top of the phi with 
can be evaluated in the value of the second uh, second. However, since this is a linear map, we don't see this. This is getting evaluated to zero. In whatever tension space it lives at zero, because if we so in the vector component this is a linear map, if we feed it to zero, we get a zero. Right? Um, so this equality is fine and will be part of my exercise. Huh? Okay, and now uh, what we see here, this is x evaluated as alpha of phi m. Right? Why? Because this is phi evaluated in m and then we compose it with x. Or in other words, we take the x and this alpha is just the evaluation. Okay, what this longish thing, or what this computation means, this strange vector field Rx times zero is alpha related to the original vector field x. So we now know what the uh, what the deep bracket must be. So um, we basically know that if we take Rx times zero m, Ry times zero m. How do you compute the Lie bracket of such a product? Well, by definition, this is the Lie bracket of Rx with the Lie bracket of Ry times the Lie bracket. Well, actually, I'm not. I mean, the Lie bracket of zero m, zero m. Okay, this one I can already delete. And whatever it is, it's zero. Okay, so this is always zero m. And it's alpha related to the lead bracket of the x. So therefore, I know uh, that. So I mean, the second part actually plays no role. And so what I what I know is that this lead bracket for the right hand vector fields is related to the lead bracket of the original vector fields. So therefore. Um, e M is given by the negative bracket of the Why the negative? Because we were using right invariant vector fields here in the computation, and using right invariant stuff gives you the wrong side. Right? So the bracket of the right invariant vector fields is related to the bracket of the original vector fields. And uh, since I wanted to identify this, uh, this bracket, I see that I get the wrong sign in the computation. And actually, yes. exactly. Yeah. So what I what I've been seeing here, uh, the additional step because it's getting late, is I mean, this is the invariant bracket I'm I'm computing to go back to the tangent space at the identity. In this picture here, I need to evaluate it at the identity element. Right. The identity element is just the and. Uh, Okay, uh, I hope that was reasonably clear. Uh, so I think that's that's it for, for this lecture. We have lunch now and return with a problem session. Talk.